Alexandrien from uh, Cipios. Alex is Solution Architect. Hi, Nicolas. Hi, Alex. How are you? I'm fine, and you? Great. So you will present Green APIs? Yeah. Perfect. So if you can share your screen and, and just check that everything is OK. All right. I, I, think, I think you can see the screen. Yeah, I think it's All perfect. Right. Let's go. OK, Alex. So please start. Thanks. Hi, guys. Um, I'm glad to, to be here in this uh, API Days conference. It's, it's actually the, the second time I have the chance to talk about uh, subjects that drive me. And what I'd like to talk about is how to build green APIs. I know that the green subject is vast and can be about uh, a lot of things. So to clarify, I would like to, to start with what I won't address in this talk. For obvious reasons, I, I will not talk about the, the green color. And I also will not talk about uh, actually green objects, such as plants. This will be about how to be more green in IT. And by that, I mean create a more sustainable way to build uh, tech products for our future. So uh, let's dive in. First, I'd like to break down uh, what is harming the, the planet in the IT ecosystem. Basically, we can, we can summarize by saying that it all begins with uh, hardware production. This is where devices um, such as smartphones, computers, but also servers are produced. And the factories producing hardware are consuming a lot of energy, and they are using rare materials, which are then missing on the planet. Then when devices are distributed, they are used every day by humans. And the usage of, of those devices aren't actually uh, using so much energy in, in comparison to factories producing them. Uh, of course, I, I'm not saying that they don't consume energy, but this is significantly uh, less than factories. And since devices are often connected to the internet, they, they can access the World Wide Web using wireless technologies such as uh, Wi-Fi or 4G. And those points of connection uh, are powered by electricity and consume a lot, especially 4G and similar technologies. Then the, the rest of internet can be uh, understood as, uh, as a big network of cables. And again, that part is not the main problem. Internet does not uh, work magically only with wires. So everything happens in, on the server side, which are basically computers connected to the internet. And that is a part that is consuming a lot of energy. If we break down the different parts that constitute a server, you have the computing unit, the storage, and the random access memory. And in those three parts, the computing unit, um, which is responsible for all the calculations, is the one taking the more, the more resources. So uh, what should we do? Well, if we think of ways to improve on our side when uh, creating tech products, we should focus on two things. We should first try to minimize the amount of new hardware that is needed. And on the other side, uh, we should make those devices consume less energy. From, from my point of view, I, I wanted to help the cause. And I, I asked myself and the people interested as well in the question, how could we, how could we have uh, an impact? My name is Alex Adrian. I, I work at CPOs. Uh, we're fixing banking by creating custom applications and by using, well, APIs. And at CPS, I'm a solutions architect. I, I figure out the, the best tech solution when a client first comes to us with a problem. And I, for myself, wanted to be able to answer the question, can you do a green app? And I thought that if... I was able to create tech products with uh, some guidelines to make it more green, then I should do so. So at CPS, we try to create guidelines and principles on how to make more green products. And I would like to take you through our understanding. First, uh, let's take a simple example. Let's imagine uh, a physical button, uh, a simple button that does something 
I don't even know what, and let's say it's not important. But let's imagine that every time you press that button, something happens and consume energy. Well, if you are in charge of designing this button, you have a, a responsibility. Um, if you decide to write push me on this button, the, this decision will have an impact on how frequently this button is pressed. I guess we can all agree that uh, humans are, are more likely to push a button when push me is written on it. But that small decision at, at high scale can make your button be way more energy consuming than you thought. Of course, you could argue that everything at high scale uh, can be more energy consuming. But if that um, Pashmi label wasn't necessary, then maybe you're responsible for the difference that it does in energy consumption. Now, let's make it a uh, tech product. Since almost everything is a web product nowadays, you'll want to implement uh, your button as a web app. And depending on how you coded your app, you could have missed the most efficient way to code it. By that, I mean that coding is not easy, and there is there are plenty of ways to implement the same functionality. And if you see if you see your code in a, in a green perspective, you'll be paying close attention on how efficient your code is. For example, if, the, if, if in the code of this button there is a calculation that changes nothing for the user, it is consuming energy every time the button is pressed. And at scale, this will represent a significant amount of energy consumed for nothing. Anyway, a web application in 20, 2021 is never alone. It's always connected to the internet. There, the, the same principle applies. Uh, if, you, if you decide to send to the internet an amount of data that is not actually useful for the user, but because you just want this data, this represents information that goes through internet and is therefore uh, consuming energy. And last, your enormous amount of data going through the internet is computed on your server side. There, we could talk again about the impact of uh, writing efficient code. But there is another thing. If you have a server running at home, uh, that server is consuming energy, whether or not it is used. And uh, every time you use it, it might not have been at full capacity. And if you link the usage of this server to its electricity consumption, you'll find that there is waste because your server is generally oversized for its task or even because it is turned on when nobody's using it. So behind that strange example I took lies four principles that we at CPOs think a tech product should follow. Let's detail those principles. The, the first one is, is about addiction. When we looked at tech products on the web, uh, we thought that some functionalities are maybe too consuming for the added value they provide. I don't want to be that guy who is blaming Facebook like everyone else, but anyway, I'll say it. I, I, I don't think the infinite scroll on Facebook is a feature that should exist. When you look at uh, how much content is loaded and how much people are actually consciously enjoying it, sounds like a bad idea. So this principle uh, tells us to avoid writing push me on a button when it's not needed for the user. And, I can understand people challenging this vision and saying that it's all about business and we need to see in another perspective and so on. But my point is, um, we should trigger a discussion about the, the ratio of energy, con energy consumption and uh, value added to, to actually be able to align everybody on it. That's it. It's, it's no big. The second principle is, is a much more techy one. Uh, it's about writing good code that is performing enough, but not too much calculations for what you want to do. The third principle is, is to avoid too much network traffic. If you design an app uh, that is sending data through the internet, be careful of what you send. There is, there is no point in sending data that you don't use on the back end, and it has an impact. So we should be careful about this. And the fourth and last principle is avoid too many servers. I, 
I love that one because it sounds like a magical one. It sounds so simple, but of course it isn't. Um, it might sound crazy simple to just turn off a server when you're not using it, but it, it took time to the tech industry to be able to do it correctly. And that is actually the, the more visible principle in the industry right now. A lot of companies are considering moving to cloud computing because it, it allowed them a better control on their costs. And since costs are indexed to the computing usage of your account, it is often linked to the, the green impact. So that's it, uh, four principles. What I like about those principles is uh, it, it's all about, <clears throat> sorry, it's all about discussing and uh, trying to understand uh, how we can act. So keep in mind that we, we want to save the planet uh, by creating our tech products around those principles. But then, um, where should you start after you understood those principles? Well, guess what? I, I'm happy to announce that uh, there is a solution for you. The solution is called evolutionary architecture. You can find a lot of books about it. Uh, the concept is pretty simple. The concept is that you should always keep in mind that whether or not you want it, your tech architecture will evolve in time. because. There is no way for you to create more and more features without making your architecture evolve. But the concept of evolutionary architecture is to accept that it is evolving and carefully watch a specific and concrete system quality attributes. For example, you'll want to watch your architecture evolve by precisely looking at performance because it is important for you. You can see on the screen a lot of examples of system quality attributes. You can see um, provability, integrity, uh, flexibility, and many more. And those are called illities because the majority of them end with illity. And those are examples of uh, system quality attributes. But those are also measurements that you want to follow through the journey of your architecture. And uh, why is that important? Uh, because when you're adding features, you want your whole system to still be aligned with what you believe in. And a way to do that is to look at metrics, measurements. So when making our apps more green, um, what we're doing is making sure that the sustainability is kept at an acceptable level. So every time you look at your system, you're going to calculate some metrics, some notation. In a way, you, you grade your system using a calculation formula. And when you're making, <clears throat> sorry, when you're making your architecture evolve towards a new system or with a new feature, you'll grade it again. And then you can compare with the previous notation and decide whether or not it's a good idea to go in a certain way. There is another concept to better understand how it can help you to make more green APIs. The concept is fitness functions. Uh, you can see fitness functions as an item in the toolbox of evolutionary architecture. It is the concept of having a mechanism that calculates a matrix. So basically, in the best case scenario, we want to write pieces of code that calculates a metric about our system. And you, you, can, you can actually use it for many things. Uh, for example, um, you can implement a fitness function in your integration pipeline to make sure it doesn't go below a threshold, or even to make sure it is always going up. You can also use it as a monitoring or alerting tool. Uh, if you're in charge of a development team, you could, you could run your fitness function every day and, and be able every day to detect times where it is going in the wrong direction. That is, that is another, another use case. And Another, another very different example uh, is, is when doing chaos engineering. You could, you could write a, a function that trades your recovery scenario and choose the best strategy based on this because it follows uh, your ability. But the thing to remember is that it is up to you to, to find a convenient and helping way to use fitness functions. So. 
let's wrap everything together. Uh, we looked at principles that we should follow to make our APIs and tech products more green. We found four principles to do that. One way to enforce and make sure those principles are being followed is to have an evolutionary architecture approach. The tools to use to measure an architecture system quality attributes are fitness functions. And uh, I strongly believe that a tech team could drive its product using this kind of matrix uh, you can see on the screen with the the four principles in column and each new development listed in rows. For example, if you, if you implement a way for your users to upload community videos in your platform, you'll make the grade of the network traffic go up. And since you have uh, implemented a fitness function to calculate it, you, you'll be able to measure the increase with a, a number. Then let's say you decide to act on your infrastructure by uh, implementing an auto-scaling strategy for your servers to, to react when more users are using the platform. That implementation lowers the server consumption metric. And then if, if you need your user to, to, to now be able to search through your, your data, you'll want a search bar with a, a search algorithm. And that implementation will have an effect on your code complexity. But each new feature is not, not always linked to only one green principle. We could think that if you need an infinite scroll on your app, I'm sure after many discussions to prove that you need it, that feature increases the addictive uh, feature grade and the network traffic one. I hope you can imagine that having this kind of visual management tool will help your teams to have discussions about which development uh, should be prioritized. And I believe the, the, the goal is not to make your app go directly green, but to actively look at helping metrics and decide to, to act on it. So <clears throat> that, was, that was the method. And you might have questions about uh, how to actually implement that in your architecture. So let's take a look at a few concrete examples. Here is an example of a fitness function written in Java as an integration test. Um, you could embed it in your CI CD pipelines. Uh, what it does is <coughs> it calls an endpoint in <coughs> sorry and measure the time it takes um, to process and return all the information. So if you run that test with the same fixtures in the same environment, you'll have an objective measure of your code complexity. And if one day you implement a new feature and that fitness function returns a higher value, well, you'll know that you complexified the code. And uh, about that, the, the code complexity is, is hard to grasp because I guess it's not it's not it's not easy even for human uh, to judge if a piece of code is complex or not. And one way to understand it is to measure the time complexity of the code as a proxy metric of the code complexity. So that is what is implemented here. Moving on to another example. This one is about the network traffic. Uh, the approach I had in this one is is linked to how we use network. Um, you might have seen that an enormous amount of worldwide web uh, traffic is, is used by video streaming platforms. Media streaming is, is, is huge. Uh, and if you, look, if you look at an app, uh, the highest amount of data transfers will be taken by your media content, such as images and videos. So before attacking the size of your API response payloads, you, you should start by measuring the size of your media elements. To do that, I, I go to the Cypress test. Uh, Cypress is an end-to-end -end testing framework. Here it's, it simulates my platform and intercepts all the images coming from my content delivery network. So every time there is a media loaded, it adds the size of the media in account. In the end, I have a sum of all the content that was loaded in my tests. 
So this is a measure of how network consuming my app can be in its critical mass. <clears throat> and for the last example, uh, I wanted to show a different way to write a fitness function. Imagine you have an AWS account. Uh, you created servers to support your app, and uh, you want to know how much your servers are consuming energy. As AWS is invoiced on how much you consumed their resources, one easy way and fast way to create a fitness function is to sum all the costs uh, of, the, of the AWS account. And uh, you can do that as a fitness function. You can see on the screen that I used the, the AWS node SDK to get the, the cost, and I just returned the total of the cost. So it's not perfect, but at least it's a measure. So that was the, the last example I have for you. I, I hope you learned something. And if I had to summarize, uh, what I want you to remember is, is that the best approach we have to make a green API is based on two things. First, Remember the four principles to, to guide you through the understanding of what's consuming energy. And second, try to precisely look at what your architecture does and use the, the tools you have to, to measure it. That's, that's all for me. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. And a big thanks to the API Day staff for the opportunity. I love to participate in this. And now is the time where I answer questions, I believe, if Nicholas is going to come again. Nicholas, are you there? Hello. All right. Hello. Will you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry, I was not uh, on stage. <laughs> Okay, th thanks a lot for your uh, presentation. It was uh, really interesting. Thanks. Uh, so let's start with uh, with uh, Q&A. So everybody, uh, do not hesitate to ask any question on the chat. And uh, I will ask them to uh, to Alex. Um, so Alex, first of all, I, I have a question regarding the, let's say, the best practices and the saving. Do you know how much you can save by following, uh, let's say, sustainable best practices? Or, or if you don't have figures, do you have, let's say, objective when you start a tech project? Mm. So you mean how can we size the objective of um, energy saving in a project, right? Yeah. So um, basically, I'm not. I'm not 100% sure on this because we at CPS did um, some green audits on a project. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really interesting because uh, when we looked at uh, how much we wanted to save, we we realized that we were completely wrong about the, the objectives. So basically, the short answer is I don't have the answer. And I'd like to, but I don't. And yeah. I guess the, the first time to help people to understand how they can make more green API and products is to um, give more principles. And I'm, I'm sure we'll find out how to size the goal that we can have on energy saving. But from now, I don't have the answer to that, but like we should we should discuss it. And I I think it depends on on every project. It can, can be different and you can can try to size uh, the goal you want to achieve, but it's like uh, it's different for every project. Okay. And uh, regarding regarding the let's say the measurement, I, 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 you presented a slide with the impact of your uh, fitness function. Yeah. And uh, what is the unit of this uh, let's say um, saving? Is is it uh, time? Is it data? How do you yeah, estimate that's... that? For example, adding a search bar is adding. Uh, if I if we, I remember a slide, uh, two dot uh, something. Yeah, so that's a fascinating question because um, I didn't want to put a unit on this yeah. because I, I believe that um, every project team should have a discussion about it. So mm -hmm. what we do at CPO says um, when you when we create uh, some fitness function uh, measurement, we we create the calculation um, criteria and algorithm. 
So maybe we can say that, uh, let's take an example of a simple API endpoint returning data. Well, we, we want that uh, this endpoint, uh, we want this endpoint to return data fastly. And let's say, imag let's imagine that uh, the endpoint returns data in 10 seconds. We, we will assign 10 seconds, the grade of 10 out of uh, a scale from zero to 10. And we arbitrarily choose that. So the grade is then uh, from one to 10 and there is no unit. It's, it's like, it could be a percentage. But okay. the point is, we should we should choose carefully what we want to follow because the the um, the trap uh, not to fall in is that you you provide a way to choose a unit for everybody, and then when a new project uh, is created, they don't actually understand the unit, and they're doing anything with it, and it doesn't make any sense anymore, and so you, you lose the interest. So and and also when you have a fitness function that has some variability, you may want to tweak the way it's calculated so that you don't see the variability in your graph. So uh, that was a long answer to say that there is no unit or you choose it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, another question. Do, do you think that there is a, or there are languages or frameworks that are greener than other? Mm. Well, I guess the scientific way to um, to answer this question would be like if if we take the example of a, a front end web framework like Angular or React, we could try to code the same app and mm -hmm. uh, analyze the performances of uh, the those two apps in the two uh, frameworks and uh, look at data because maybe some framework is loading faster and the other one is doing less calculations. I don't know, but the, a scientific way to do that would be to test. And I actually don't know uh, web framework that are completely um, identified by everybody as a green framework. Okay. And, uh, okay, so uh, another question regarding your, uh, let's say your initiative Around uh, around fitness function or your uh, your let's say green initiative in CPOs, uh, is it uh, let's say is it a CPOs initiative, or do you think that your customer ask for that? Oh, both. Um, so at CPOs, we we have people uh, um, that want to help the cause. So. Uh, we created a group of people that um, worked on that and that led to the four principles and uh, that way of seeing the green cause. And, and we also have clients that want us to work on that subject because, because they are sensible to that subject or because they want to, uh, to provide a solution for their product. So yeah, both. And it, I, I don't remember uh, where it started, uh, but uh, both are interested. Okay, thank, thanks for that. Um, I think that's all for the question. Let me just check the, the Q&A. Yeah, I, I think that's all. Um, so thanks a lot, Alex. Thank if you, you have that. anything to add, please. Uh... Mm, it's fine, thank you for the opportunity and uh, I hope that uh, I, I I hope you learned something and that you're going to look at uh, measurements and precisely look at your system. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh...